Hello, this is Walter Lecce, and in this video, I will show you um, how to estimate the average treatment effect of a continuous treatment. Uh, so this uh, example is uh, from my book, Practical Professor Score Methods Using R, and it's part of Chapter 7, Professor Score Methods for Continuous Treatment Doses. Uh, this is the last video of the sequence. Um, if previous videos, I estimated those response function, and then I estimated inverse probability weights with different methods and evaluated the covert balance. So in this video, we will start already with uh, heavy inverse probability weights that I estimated uh, in previous videos. Okay, so uh, here the example is to estimate the effect uh, of uh, school use of the algebra nation of virtual learning environment in Florida or the school level B of the Florida algebra one and of course assessment. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, start by loading previous results. Uh, this data set and code is available in the website practicalpropensityscore.com. And uh, from the previous evaluation of covert balance, I know that from the different weights I estimated, the inverse probability weight obtained with the covariate balance propensity score method provided the best covariate balance. So that's the weight we use here. Uh, I use the package survey to fit the models as a good package for when you have simply weights or any kind of uh, propensity score weights as well. So uh, first thing we'll define the survey design where I declare the weight that I'm using EPW3 is the weight I obtained with covert balance propensity score method. Um, we'll actually look at a few different outcome models. The first model is just the outcome as a function of the treatment dosage, log log is per exam D. Okay. And uh, I'm using um, just a uh, a linear regression model for this uh, assuming uh, normally distributed residuals. So I'm fitting here. For this model, the, the effect of log log is per exam is not statistically significant. Now, I'll, as uh, then I obtain a standardized effect here, which is really not useful here because it's not statistically significant. But I will try an alternative model where I add some nonlinear terms to see if log log is, per example, D is nonlinearly related to the outcome. And I fit this model here. So I add that you know, log log is, per example, D, the square of log log is, the, of per example, D, and the cube of log log is, per example, D as predictors. Uh, and then, is not statistically significant, um, but, I, but I will compare these models with a uh, likelihood ratio test. And I find that the p-value is not significant, so we would prefer the simpler model, which is the model without the polynomial terms. Um, but then I'll try a doubly robust model, which is a model where I include not only the dose uh, of treatment, but also the covariance. The advantage of this model is by, you know, having modeled the those response function when I estimated the weights, and now here modeling the outcome, um, it gives me the double robust property, which means my model may is robust to be incorrect either in the um, generalized propensity score model that I estimated earlier, or this outcome model. Uh, adding covariates may also increase power if the covariates are related strongly to the outcome and can explain some of the residual, okay? So we will fit the doubly robust model and look at it. And now here, the log log is per XMD is statistically significant. And I attribute that to increase in power by adding this covariance. 
I will be taking the standardized coefficient. And it's about the same size as the one I've dated from previous model, um, 0 0.06, okay? Now, as a final step, it's important to run a sensitivity analysis. I'll use a newer method, Sinelli's sensitivity analysis method that's implemented in the SenseMaker package. It's a very good method, and I, I particularly like that he puts the interpretations as part of the output. Uh, so here, you know, I declare my model. I declare what the treatment is. Um, I declare as a guideline what proportion of change in the effect is deemed problematic. So one means 100%. And then the alpha level would be what would be by my criteria to consider the effect significant, right? Uh, so run this. And then I get a summary with three different interpretations. The first one is the, so I get that the partial it, R squared is 0 0.01 to six. The robust Davis value for uh, Q1 is 0 0.1068. And the robust Davis value for Q1 and alpha 0 0.05 is 0 0.181. Um, I find, Partial it squared, partial R squared, the least helpful of these statistics, and the robustness value Q equals one alpha equals 0.05, the most helpful. The, the interpretations are here. Uh, partial R squared means that the extreme co-founder that explains 100% of the residual variance of the outcome will need to explain at least 1.26% of the residual variance of the treatment to fully account for the observed estimated effect. I found this the least helpful because thinking about an extreme co-founder that explains 100% of the residual variance of the outcome is not really realistic. Um, now for the robustness value, this would be an observed co-founder that, uh, explains 10.68% of the residual variance of both treatment and outcome are strong enough to bring the point estimate to zero. So this is helpful to know. In other words, it, it shows that the results are sensitive because you know if you have a confounder that explains 10.68% of the variance of both the treatment and outcome, it would bring the treatment effect to zero. Now, even more interesting is the last one, which is uh, the robustness value for the alpha level 0 0.05, showing here that an observed confounder that explains 1.81% of the residual variance of both treatment outcome would be strong enough to render the treatment effect not significant at alpha equals 0 0.05. So this shows that, uh, the results here are actually quite sensitive to orbital confounders because, you know, it's likely that there is a orbital confounder that explains 1.8% of the variance. Okay, so these are our results. Again, this is posted in the website practicalpropensityscore.com.